we're coming on the air with a potential breakthrough in this days-long quest to try to get the House of Representatives actually functioning. With Kevin McCarthy telling our team he thinks he's going to have the votes to become speaker tonight when lawmakers get back into session at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific. We'll talk about what he's got to do to get over the finish line. Plus, some news I know you've been hoping to hear on DeMar Hamlin tonight. His breathing tube is out. He even got a chance to FaceTime his team. We'll talk about the message he's giving the bills and what the NFL is doing next. Plus, the FDA backing a controversial drug for Alzheimer's patients. Why the questions around it highlight just how far we are from a cure for this awful disease. Plus, Florida's governor amping up his fight against Disney after the company spoke out against his so-called don't say gay law. What it could mean for your next trip to the Magic Kingdom. And we're taking a look at the tributes coming in for a famous Brazilian surfer who died riding waves at one of the world's most famous beaches. That's a little bit later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air tonight with Kevin McCarthy scrambling on Capitol Hill. We think he is negotiating as we speak behind closed doors with some of those last Republican rebels, those holdouts in his party, six of them, after a ton of momentum went his way today in his push to become the next Speaker of the House. Here's where things stand now. Everything is on timeout. They've all pressed pause until 10 o'clock Eastern tonight. Because McCarthy is way closer to having the votes he needs, but he doesn't have them yet. Still, he's telling NBC News tonight he is confident he's going to get it done. Watch. How many votes left? Yeah, what's it going to take to get over the top here? Uh, we'll get it done tonight. Okay. What time? Just with the two coming back, I mean, you still have some, at least some more members of your conference you have to convince. Uh, I've got a couple members flying back. Garrett Haig getting that little live one-on-one -on -one action there not too long ago. You had McCarthy today managing to flip the folks you see on your screen, about two-thirds of the Republicans in his own party who have been like, no way up until this point. As of now, they're like, hey, yes way. Okay, that got McCarthy to where he needed to be, closer to where he needed to be, if not at that magic number. Because there are still six Republicans who don't want to vote for him. He can only afford to lose four of them. So right now starts phase two, ramping up the pressure on these six people, the so-called rebels. Some of them have made very clear they'll never, ever, ever vote for Kevin McCarthy. However, there may be a few who will. Not Matt Gates. however. Listen. Mr. McCarthy doesn't have the votes today. He will not have the votes tomorrow. And he will not have the votes next week, next month, next year. And so one must wonder, Madam Clerk, is this an exercise in vanity? Ooh, some of McCarthy's allies didn't like that. You see what they're doing? They are walking out in protest during that speech. About 30 of them. Pretty ticked off about what Gates and these other holdouts are doing. I want to bring in now Ryan Nobles and Steve Kornacki. I'm so glad to have both of you with us. And Steve, I actually want to start with you because I want you to let there are three scenarios where as of tomorrow morning, we could be talking about Kevin McCarthy getting the speakership. Three ways he can get there tonight. Explain what they are. Yeah, and that's the reason why they wanted the adjournment till tonight, because there are two members there, Wesley Hunt uh, and Ken Buck, Republicans who support McCarthy, who were not in the chamber today, who are on their way back, and they expect will be there tonight. So you put the vote total on the screen from the last ballot. It was 214 for McCarthy, 212 for Jeffries, and then six Republicans voting for others. This is, these are the Republicans who voted for others. The one who McCarthy peeled off on the last ballot was Andy Harris from Maryland. So if you take those two Republicans who are coming back, and you put them into the mix, it does two things. First of all, they're McCarthy supporters, so it will raise him to 216 votes. It also means if all of the Democrats are also present, which they have been for just about every vote, it means there'll be 434 voting members in the chamber. So if all of them vote for a candidate, then that sets the magic number at 218, because remember, you need an outright majority. Half of 434's What's that? I want to remind people, and I've gotten this question today even from really smart people. It doesn't matter who has more votes. It matters who has the majority of votes, right? right. More than the majority of votes. If you're split 50-50 doesn't count, you've got to have the edge. That's why this matters, right? That's why even though McCarthy has more than Democrat Hakeem Jeffries, he's not speaker until he hits this magic number.
Right. Or why Jeffries didn't become speaker on any of the first, you know, 12 right. ballots or so before uh, before uh, McCarthy caught him. So it, it, it's 218 because half is 217 and it's got to be outright. So it's got to be more than exactly half. So 218 is the magic number if they're all voting. So we're saying McCarthy with these two new ones coming back would be at 216. Then you would look at this list of six. There are six holdouts from that last ballot. Simplest way, as you say, for him to get to 218 is simply to win on two of these votes voters over to win two of these members over if he can get if he can get two of them to vote for him he goes to 218 he's at the magic number doesn't matter what the other four do now there are other ways he could get there too let's say he can find one of these six who says okay I'm good with voting for Kevin McCarthy then he's up to 217 okay then let's he would need one of the other six to vote present you know, to be able to say, I'm not voting for McCarthy, but I'm not voting for somebody else. I'm going to say present. So he would need one to do that. You'd still have 212 for Jeffries, and then you'd have uh, four, excuse me, you'd have the other four voting otherwise. The present vote is key because it doesn't really count towards the total. So we're saying 434 total votes. Every present vote reduces that number. So if one vote's present, then officially, according to the House, there's only 433 votes. And half of 433 is 216.5 which if you round it up means the new magic number becomes 217. So if McCarthy gets one vote from this column and gets one present vote, then the magic number is 217 and he's at 217. And then the other way is he could just get three to vote present and he'd be fine that way too. Steve Gornacki, it is amazing to have that breakdown. Thank you, thank you, we appreciate it. To reiterate what Steve said, Ryan, either McCarthy's gotta flip, and I wanna put their names on screen. He's either gotta flip two of these people outright, he's gotta get three of them to vote present, which is kinda like the I don't exist vote, or he's gotta get one of them to flip and one of them to vote present. Who mm -hmm. are they going after the most? Conventional wisdom seems to be the guy all the way to the left here, Congressman Andy Biggs. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's anybody's guess of what the scenario is. And I think that Steve did an amazing job of laying out all these different scenarios. Uh, I think the two names I most focus on are Matt Rosendale uh, and uh, one of the new members of Congress, Representative Crane uh, of Arizona. Uh, it, but what, what we're being told is that they may be two that could potentially vote present, which would make the path to getting uh, to the magic number just a little bit more easy. Uh, and, and the reason we think that they're probably going to get Get there is because some of these uh, individual members who have been so resigned uh, to, to saying they're never going to vote for McCarthy and they were prepared to die in that hill are now kind of a, just saying that even though they're not going to vote for McCarthy, they assume that this process is over and, and Matt Gates is among them. He's never going to vote for McCarthy, but he seems uh, pretty clear that he thinks that this is all over at this point. Uh, you know, there there is a class of them and, uh, you know, put Lauren Boebert, uh, Matt Gates uh, in and Bob Good into that category where they've been so definitive uh, that it was really personally McCarthy that was their problem, uh, that they're not going to do anything that's going to help him get over the hump. And I, and I put the other three in that class uh, of anything is possible. So you put Biggs, Rosendale, and Crane in that, in that box of either a combination of one of them voting for McCarthy, three of them voting president, two voting president, one voting for McCarthy. Those are the three I think that you need to look at as being the ones that are going to move into a position that are going to that's ultimately going to get uh, Kevin McCarthy to the finish line tonight. Uh, and he could be speaker, as you say, uh, Hallie, by tomorrow morning. So let me pull back a second here, because I love this as a political nerd. I know you love it, too. But there is a bigger implication, even for people who are like, oh, my God, Hallie and Ryan, like, stop. Like, just <laughs> tell me when he's speaker and that's it. Like, I totally get that and I feel that. And here's why this matters, right? Because some of the concessions that Kevin McCarthy is making to try to get the speaker's gavel have actual implications for governing, right? Talk about yeah. what comes next. If he is able to close the deal tonight, obviously Congress members finally get sworn in and we have a functioning House of Representatives, but then they gotta go about like the business of governing. Yeah. And if this was so messy, one would think the next two years are gonna feel a little messy too, right? And the biggest reason for that, Hallie, is because they're going to institute rules that could theoretically allow this process to happen over and over and over again, because okay. there's going to be the ability for one member of Congress to say, I want a new vote on Speaker of the House at any point during the congressional uh, legislative session. So uh, if Matt Gates, uh, you know, after all this is done next week, decides he's upset with uh, Kevin McCarthy, he could say, let's do this all over again. Now, theoretically, Kevin McCarthy's now banked these votes, and unless he decides 
something to tick somebody off between now and then he'd be okay. But you could see this problem popping up that every time three or four members are just a little bit upset with the way business is being conducted, that we go through this process all over again. That's the first piece. The second piece, I'll do this quickly, is the Rules Committee, which is so powerful. Every single piece of legislation that gets to the floor of the House has to go through the Rules Committee. The Freedom Caucus is now going to dominate that Rules Committee. Uh, and so that's going to make the Freedom Caucus more powerful than they've ever been in the history of this Congress. The bottom line is, however you're streaming us right now, be streaming us again later on tonight because this could all be going down in a big way. Ryan Nobles, um, get some coffee. We'll see you later. Appreciate you. You got President Biden today over at the White House, marking something else incredibly significant happening here in Washington. And that is two years since the day of the insurrection on January 6th at an emotional ceremony at the White House, awarding one of the highest honors that a civilian in this country can get to a dozen state officials, elections workers, police officers who resisted the pressure from former President Trump, from his allies, to overturn the legitimate 2020 election results and who protected the Capitol on that awful day. Watch. History will remember your names. They'll remember your courage. They'll remember your bravery. They'll remember your extraordinary commitments to your fellow Americans. That's not hyperbole. That's a fact. Among the recipients, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, Georgia election workers, mom and daughter Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, police officers Eugene Goodman, former Washington, D.C. officer Michael Fanone. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. And Kelly, you heard it there. The president said history will remember these people's names, saying that America owes them a debt of gratitude. He also honored three people who died after January 6th. Um, very somber and really important, it seems like, for some of these people's families. Certainly to be recognized, to be in the East Room, to be given this honor, especially for those families who have paid the ultimate price where their loved one is not present today, it was certainly very emotional. And for those who lived through it but have paid other kinds of prices in terms of their reputation or their physical body, to have this kind of ceremony today uh, was clearly very emotional and very meaningful for them. And to have the president talk about uh, the courage of individuals, whether they be law enforcement or elected officials or volunteers like the women who worked uh, as elections officers, uh, volunteers in their own uh, Georgia polling place who have been the subject of so much uh, heated criticism and attacks and uh, threats against them. This array of Americans, each in their own way, showing that you can stand up for democracy in the course of your everyday life or in the line of duty or as a part of an oath that uh, you may have taken. And that uh, the forces that brought about January 6th still exist in this country. And it's sort of a message not only of looking back as to what happened two years ago, but a reminder that that vigilance is still needed today. And in the sort of split screen that we've seen a lot this week about uh, kind of the current moment where the House Republicans are having uh, their uh, internal frustrations that you were just laying out with our colleagues, uh, that what they're able to do today is in part because uh, those people in, in their different roles uh, held the line. And the Capitol, uh, although uh, bruised and battered that day, it stood. And the uh, ability to carry out the functions of government uh, carried on. And today, even if it's messy and difficult and complicated and lengthy, it is still happening. So certainly the president wanted to honor that and wanted to use this day as a way to say those are enduring values. They should be remembered as individuals, but also as a way to look forward. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us outside the White House. Kel, thank you. So part of what we talk about when we talk about January 6th is the investigation, right? The arrests for people who showed up and broke the law that day. And the DOJ right now has only three years left to prosecute those people because there is a statute of limitations. That statute of limitations will run out. And people helping with these investigations online, these internet sleuths that have been trying to identify people since the beginning, they're like, hey, Three years may not be long enough because things are moving too slow, in their view. They're frustrated because they've done the work to help figure out who these people are and some of the images you're seeing on your screen. They've handed over names, hundreds of names, to the FBI to help them out. Some of these folks haven't been arrested yet. Ryan Riley is joining us now. And, Ryan, we should first note, the DOJ's done a lot. I mean, they've, they've arrested and 
arrested like 900 people. They've had 500 just about guilty pleas, dozens of significant prison sentences, a couple of convictions on seditious conspiracy, more than we've seen in decades, right? So it's not like they're not doing nothing. Yeah. So explain why some of these internet Sherlock Holmeses, who you have covered since day two, right, <laughs> since January 7th, um, are feeling a little bit annoyed here. You know, I mean, they're data people, right? And they, it, the numbers just don't work out. If you look at the total number of people who went inside the U.S. Capitol or who assaulted law enforcement outside the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, that's a total scope of more than 3,000 people. And, you know, based on the last year, we've got about, they had about 200 arrests. Now, mind you, you know, they were knocking those back those huge wins during that last year where they were getting the seditious, these seditious conspiracy verdicts. They were, you know, processing 300 cases and the docket's full every single day. But that isn't enough to keep up with, to even get close to the number, even, you know, of more of the serious crimes that we saw that day. Because right now, you know, if you go to the FBI's website, you're going to see 350 people who have not yet been arrested, who are they, they are still trying to identify, 250 of whom uh, assaulted law enforcement officers that mm. day. On that list, already SLUs have identified more than 100 of them who have not yet been arrested. So that's just 100 people who are, you know, in one uh, one of the SLUs was telling me they get really frustrated at this uh, this notion that someone who assaulted a law enforcement officer is, you know, spending Christmas with, with, his, with his family again for the second year in a row. Who's, you know, so that's something that gets them frustrated. Some of them have gone to their kids' weddings or, you know, they've gone on vacation all after they committed this horrendous attack right. on January 6th, and they haven't faced any consequences. They've just sort of been able to move on. And they think they're anonymous, and that's one of the things that sleuths really want to drive home. Is, is to say, we correct. know who you are, we so do. guess what? Watch out. Where yeah. does this investigation from the Department of Justice go from here? Because there's now a special counsel in place. There are these really big questions about implications prosecutorially for former President Trump. That's right. Well, omnibus, the omnibus bill did give uh, the DOJ a big boost. Here Meaning that big spending revenue. bill that just passed Correct, here in Congress. Exactly. Right. So that should give them some of the resources that they uh, will be able to go forward with this. But at the same time, you know, with the House of Representatives uh, switching hands, you know, if they're ever able to pick a speaker, they're going to have a lot of scrutiny uh, that's coming into the January 6th investigation. Some of the far right members uh, of the Republican caucus have referred to these people as political prisoners. Uh, they've, yeah. you know, gone to the jail and tried to make a lot of, you know, tried to make political hay out of this and disagree with the, uh, the uh, direction that the FBI FBI and Justice Department is taking this. Ryan Riley, you've been reporting on this truly, truly since January 6th and 7th and 8th ever since then. So we're glad to have you on this story for the past two years. Appreciate it. No problem. Speaking of January 6th, tonight I'll be hosting a special report here on NBC News Now on the January 6th committee, its report, the key moments from the investigation. That's at 9 o'clock Eastern. You can stream that right here, however you're watching, on NBC News Now. Let's talk about the markets, because they are absolutely loving these December jobs numbers that are out today, giving Wall Street some hope that maybe inflation will start to be not so painful sometime soon. Look at this. The Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq shooting up into the green, each more than 2 percent. What is it they like? The so-called Goldilocks numbers you're about to see here. Not too hot, not too cold. 200,000 jobs added was the estimate, 223 100,000 jobs added was the actual number. Um, listen, unemployment's 3.5%. We haven't seen that number, a number that low since Diana Ross and the Supremes had the top song in the country. December 1969, folks, that's the last time we saw an unemployment rate like this. The song, by the way, is Someday We'll Be Together. Brian Chung is at the big board. And I, you know, this description of the economic snapshot that we're getting in this jobs report is like the idea that it's a Goldilocks market right now. Help us understand that. Yeah, and I think uh, Everyday People, Sly and the Family Stone, was also 1969. And that's what we're talking okay. about here, right? Everyday People, you see what I did there? We're talking about monthly changes <laughs> by industry and all those job gains. Looking at leisure and hospitality in particular, these are uh, bars and restaurants where we saw 67,000 jobs get added, but it wasn't all good in every sector of the economy. That's why we open up the hood to these numbers. Professional and business services, this is going to include a lot of those tech jobs. We've been hearing a lot of those big tech companies making layoffs recently, actually contracting by about 6,000 between November and December. And then interestingly, take a look at employment services. This is essentially headhunters and also those that help employers find temporary workers contracting by about 39,000 uh, jobs. So this tells you that maybe the appetite is weaning a little bit for future employment, although some of this might be seasonal after the big holiday season. But nonetheless, interesting to see that there are some parts of the economy that are getting job gains, but then some that are not, Hallie. It's super interesting, Brian, because there has been this question about what does the Fed do as it relates to inflation, right? So how do the numbers that we're seeing today help give us any clues as to what the Fed may do and whether we're going to end up in a mini recession 
or like a really big bad recession later on in the year? Yeah, they've been raising rates through 2022, but they've been mm -hmm. slowing the pace of those rate increases. But what they're really looking for in this report is this number right here. Average hourly earnings. How much more did people make compared to this time last year? If you look at November 2022 to November 2021, wages went up by 4.8 percent. That pace slowed in December to December, looking at 4.6 percent in that report we got this morning. So wage pressures are decreasing a little bit. But remember, inflation, 7.1 percent, which means that people are not making enough money to account for how much more expensive things are getting at the store. That's why the Federal Reserve says they want to continue to slow the economy to make this number go down faster than this number. Expectation is that in their next meeting, which is February 1st, by the way, they'll continue to raise interest rates, markets pricing in a high likelihood of a quarter basis point hike. Brian Chong, it's great to see you. Thank you for that breakdown and for your vast and encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> of 1960s tunes. Appreciate it. I got it. you. Some good news for you tonight because the Buffalo Bills say DeMar Hamlin is off his breathing tube. He's talking with his family. Think about that progress just a few days after what happened on the field during Monday Night Football, right? His team, the Bills, tweeting out this morning that Hamlin also spoke with his teammates on FaceTime. He had a message. Love you, boys. And Bills head coach Sean McDermott says Hamlin's biggest words were through his gestures. Watch. The thing that <laughs> makes me laugh is, is he did this to the guys, you know, okay. right away. And, um, he flexed, he flexed, uh, he flexed on them, I guess. He made the heart, the heart symbol probably more than anything. Um, and then he gave him a thumbs up. Jesse Kirsch is outside Highmark City. I'm in Orchard Park, New York. It brings chills to me, at least, Jesse, to think about the, the incredible progress that Jamar Hamlin has made because we saw the urgency on the field on Monday night, how truly life or death it was for Jamar Hamlin, who had to be resuscitated there. And now, you know, flexing to his team, telling him I love you, talking with his family. Um, it's incredible, and it puts somebody else in the spotlight here, the trainer who helped save his life. Yeah, and, and Hallie, just to underscore again, right, we're talking about not even four full days yeah. still since this horrific incident occurred on national television. And it would have been amazing enough to hear about him writing with pen and paper. He's talking. That's what we're hearing from the team. It's an unbelievable situation. Like you said, it. I don't think you could ever have a flex to top this flex from DeMar Hamlin. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the, a lot of the praise being heaped as well on the medical team that helped him, including an assistant trainer for the Buffalo Bills, Denny Kellington. And just We have a couple of stats about him here so he's with the team he's been with the team since 2017 he used to be with Syracuse University and he is being credited with playing a large role in helping to save DeMar Hamlin's life because he is said to be the person according to the team who is administering CPR to Hamlin on Monday night and we know from the medical team that held a briefing yesterday that the quick response from medical staff at the game on Monday likely contributed to him being on the road to recovery. Uh, and we could have had a very different situation as how it has been laid out if he did not have that immediate CPR and have uh, defibrillation on the scene there when he was in cardiac arrest. So hats off, obviously, the medical team and this assistant trainer getting uh, well-deserved praise uh, across, not just from the team, but uh, across uh, the, the the spectrum of football fans. We've even seen some people suggesting medical teams, including this trainer, should be in the Hall of Fame or have space for recognition on some level like that. Here's part of what the head coach for the Bills said about this trainer's work. I've got a country station on highway, I think it's called Highway Country or something like that. And who are they talking about? But Denny Kellington, um, the assistant trainer from the Buffalo Bills. And I got to imagine that's a national uh, station. So um, I shared that with, with Denny this morning and he got a uh, good kick out of that. So again, right, we're talking about people who aren't the stars of the game on a uh, typical Sunday, perhaps, but certainly uh, deserve a lot of attention and applause from uh, football fans all over. It's really incredible. Talk to us about this weekend, right, what we're going to see tomorrow, I think. Are there there's games tomorrow, the first games that we're going to see since this injury happened. What's it like? I mean, we know the Bills-Bengals um, game is not going to get replayed. That's done. They're never going to go back to that. Fine. The league's made all these accommodations and do, done different things to, like, continue the season. But tell me what you're hearing on that front. Yeah, so tomorrow the first game back will be the Chiefs 
playing at Las Vegas against the Raiders. Obviously, there's going to be anxiety amongst fans. One analyst who uh, spoke very eloquent, eloquently and, and, and personally and emotionally uh, on Monday night said that this is going to be that first snap is going to be one of the hardest snaps likely that we'll ever see. So mm -hmm. that is something that will obviously be on the, the minds of players, you can imagine, right? Certainly on the minds of fans as well, people watching. I asked people what they'll be expecting here on Sunday when the Bills play a home game against the New England Patriots to close out the season. And uh, one fan told me he thinks that at first it, it might, you know, be a tough situation, but thinks they'll be able to push through it. Another fan describing the scene she expects here on Sunday to be electric because of the road to recovery we are seeing from DeMar Hamlin, taking what could have been a somber salute to him uh, as he was in, you know, a questionable medical condition to something that could be much more of a celebration than we were expecting 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago. Jesse Kirsch, I'm glad to have you there. Um, and it's really nice to be able to talk about progress and improvement for DeMar Hamlin. It's, it's huge. Thank you so much. The FDA today approving a new drug to try to help treat Alzheimer's, which sounds like it could be a promising development, but it also has shown us how far there really is to go to get to a cure. That's because clinical trials have shown that this drug can slow down some of the memory loss for people who are in the early stages of Alzheimer's. Again, not a, clear, a cure, rather, but maybe something that slows down Alzheimer's, giving people more lucid time with the people who they love. That's so, so valuable. However, there are some real potential side effects that have been seen with this drug. As one in nine people over the age of 65 have this disease, six and a half million plus people over that age who are currently living with it, probably gonna double by 2050. Dr. Torres is joining us now. Dr. John, tell us a little bit about the benefits, but also some of the potential side effects, why this drug is so controversial here. And Hallie, you, you hit the nail on the head. This is not a cure, but it certainly is a slowing down of progression of Alzheimer's for some people. And for families and caretakers of those people, this is going to be a world change for them. And at the same time, critics are saying, you know, we need to slow down a little bit because this is not the medicine that we really need here, but it certainly might be a step in the right direction. And what this medicine is, it's a monoclonal antibody that actually attacks the plaques that are in the, in the brain that we think might be causing part of the Alzheimer's thing. But it, it, we know that attacking those amyloid plaques doesn't necessarily necessarily get rid of the Alzheimer's or slow down that cognition, but this one is showing it does. But like you mentioned, there are some safety concerns, and that's where a lot of experts are saying, wait, we don't even know if this should be getting this accelerated approval, which is not full approval, but definitely can push it in the right direction. So they think we need to get more studies, more people in there, and bigger trials in order to get a good idea of what's going on here. As somebody, is one of the many millions and millions of people in this country who has seen a loved one suffer from dementia, um, why is it that we are still so far away from a cure? Because you've laid it out, right? Lakembi has these warnings, and yet there's a potential that it could slow down the disease. What, what is, we've been researching this for 100 years, Alzheimer's, right? Like, why is it so yeah, tough to figure out a cure? For... And that's not a dig. I just am a like, genuine question here. No, and it's a great question, and that's part of the controversy that's going on here, and that's part of the reason, I think, for the accelerated approval is there was two schools of thought. One is that we need a better medicine. The other school of thought is we need this medicine right now because we only have one other one, that Adahelm, that's also proven controversial, but these are medicines in the right direction that seem to be affecting it a little bit. Even though that little bit is there, it is more than we've had in the past, and this will encourage other developers to try and develop drugs. If they stopped doing this, then other developers might not, and that's what some of the experts are saying as well. You know, it does have its side effects. It does have mm -hmm. its issues. But this is the first one that's shown some cognition benefit. And so I think, you know, according to the American Alzheimer's Association, this is the right direction to move in. And they do expect and they do hope that other patients will be getting it and will be improving from it. Anything, anything that gives people more time with the people they love um, is huge. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. Appreciate it. The father of an Idaho murder victim is opening up to NBC News and responding to some of what's come out in some of these newly unsealed documents about that mysterious murder in Idaho that killed four students. We're talking about Steve Gonsalves, the father of Kaylee, reacting to what we've learned about a roommate who survived, who we're just learning this week, came nearly face to face with the killer. The way they responded, he's shown some sympathy for these housemates after some early questions about whether or not the roommates might have been suspects themselves and criticism over how long it took for the 911 call to happen. Listen. I think it's another victim of this crime, I mean, did she act perfectly? Did she do everything like how I would do or a strong individual that was, you know, went through different battles and different things? Sure, they would do it different, but this is a girl that that's, wasn't prepared to see what she's seen. 
Dana Griffin is joining us now. And Dana, we know that that surviving roommate told police she was in a state of frozen shock when she saw the person, the killer, in black, face covered, right? Basically mm -hmm. walking past, yeah. um, walking out a door. And that is just a strikingly compassionate response there from Steve Gonsalves. Yeah, and I think it was really important for him to say that because that's been one of the big questions that we've been talking to people here in the community. They're like, you know, that sounds odd. Why didn't this roommate call police or what happened in between those hours uh, from around four in the morning to close to noon that day? And I think that he's trying to possibly paint her you know, as a victim as well, as he said. And it may help people in this community to kind of say, okay, maybe this person just didn't know what to do in that moment. Or, you know, there have been other theories floating around that, you know, a lot of college students drink and maybe what she saw, you know, could have just been another roommate or a friend of a roommate in the house. Because I was speaking to one room, one um, college, uh, a former college student who said that, you know, I've been in a house where I've seen people that I've never seen before walk in and out. And maybe this could have been a situation of maybe uh, this was a friend of someone, even though she may have been in frozen shock and may have felt weird. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, and that wasn't revealed in the affidavit, but I'm sure if this goes to trial, that person may be called to the stand, and maybe yeah. we'll learn more about what happened. We're also learning more as we get into some of these now newly unsealed documents, like about how phone records from a cell phone show that this suspect now was actually near this house, near the house where this happened, 12 times between June and November when these murders happened. So investigators are kind of mm -hmm. saying, look, that shows this was planned in advance, but we still don't know, know like, almost anything else beyond that. That's right, Hallie. What's interesting is that when they put that information in the affidavit, they were specific to say that usually, or in cases where people want to commit these types of crimes, they will either stake out or pre-plan and try to run through how they're going to do this. And the fact that they stated that versus stating that, you know, he may have had a relationship with someone, that may be very telling as to how they are going to present this case. Hallie? Dana Griffin live for us there in Moscow, Idaho. Dana, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, a star of the Housewives series sentenced for wire fraud today. How much time she's getting for apparently ripping off elderly people in our five things. Plus, one of Hawaii's most active volca volcanoes. Look at this, erupting again. We'll talk about what officials are saying about the possibility of threats to the community coming up. We're learning today Governor Ron DeSantis is moving to put Disney World's special tax district in Florida under state control, which would end a deal that goes back to the 1960s. DeSantis's office, in a statement, says the corporate kingdom has come to an end and that Disney's going to have to live under the same laws as everyone else and pay more taxes. This whole fight started when the company, then run by former CPO, CEO Bob Chapek, um, spoke out against Florida's don't say gay, as it's called, law, right? That's what critics call it. In response, DeSantis and some Florida lawmakers said, okay, Disney, you're going to say that. We're going to end some of the privileges you get, like having this special district where you don't have to go through as much red tape to get stuff done. They've been kind of cutting Disney a break on that front for a while. We've reached out to Disney for comment. We haven't heard back. Sam Brock is joining us now. So, Sam, the idea here is that Disney seems to have um, gotten itself into this political battle and... DeSantis and team are kind of saying, hey, sucks to be you, essentially, right? Because the company's <laughs> new CEO, Bob Iger, who's back, has said he doesn't want Disney involved in the controversy, et cetera. This is dollars and cents for Disney because they've had the benefit for decades now of being able to cut through some red tape, get some tax breaks, because they bring in so much money to Florida. Um, that yeah. may be changing. Right. So first of all, corporate kingdom comes to an end. Definitely translates to sucks to be you. That's it basically does. what you were trying to read. I think that's that objectively the lines fair. That's what he's saying. <laughs> totally, Hallie. I would say if you've covered Ron DeSantis or lived in the state of Florida for a day, for a week, for a month, you know this is an issue that is extremely important to him. He does not believe that corporations should be meddling with government propositions or social issues. And so when Disney, Disney did become sort of enmeshed in this big conversation and controversy, this became punitive. And that's exactly what you're seeing right now. The big question becomes, how are they going to fill this void? This goes back to 1967, I believe, when the special district, the Reedy Creek Improvement District, 
district was established so that Disney could come into this really sparse area of Central Florida and develop the empire that is today Disney World. So they do that. They have the ability to essentially run their own little government there, can even raise taxes. Now DeSantis is saying you're not getting the benefit of being able to, to raise money, to oversee this as a municipality. You're out. And now the DeSantis administration is going to handpick, he says, and place five of his own representatives in there to run this little fiefdom. The question becomes, how do you have a government that's run by handpicked folks from the DeSantis administration and not necessarily elected by voters? And how does it get worked out with the taxes that need to be raised? And the other component to this, Hallie, is that there's 700 million in unsecured debt that the state allegedly is going to ask Disney to repay. You cannot envision a scenario in which Disney does not take this to court. So there's a lot of steps that really need to be connected first. When this whole thing between Disney and DeSantis started to go down, there was a poll by Heart Research and Public Opinion showing that out of 1,000 adults, 33% viewed Disney positively compared to 28% for DeSantis. Here's my question to you. Does any of this matter to the people who wow. are going to Disney, right? Like, in other words, if you're trying to get out to Disney this summer with your kids and Disney's got to maybe pay more taxes, could prices go up? Like, is there a functional consumer impact here or is this mostly kind of political intrigue? Oh, there's no doubt that the families have to pay more money to go to Disney, hmm. which is already a relatively pricey proposition. Our, depending yes, on what you want there's already to do controversy there. over that. That would be right. deeply problematic. But I think Disney is going to say, well, why are we going to be passing on cost to consumers when we're not going to pay $700 million of unsecured debt? I mean, we haven't gotten a response from Disney yet as to how they're going to handle this. But there's just way too many sort of suppositions at this point to really figure out how it's going to impact consumers. But the bottom line is DeSantis wanted to make sure that taxes would not be raised for the people that are living in Orange and Osceola counties, which is where the heart of this controversy really lies, is if you're, if you're going to get rid of this district, are the taxpayers expected to foot the bill for all of these services? DeSantis says no. We'll see how this plays out. Sam Brock, great to have you on it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our resident Florida man here. Thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the U.S. is announcing more than $3 billion to help Ukraine's military today. This includes something really important. Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles. They're not tanks, but they kind of look like them. They're powerful. Kyiv wants them. They're also going to get some artillery systems, some missiles, some ammo. There's also money in there to modernize the Ukrainian military and try to get more European partners to donate their own equipment to Ukraine. It comes as both Germany and France have announced they're going to send in more help to Ukraine as well. Number two, a judge has sentenced Real Housewives of Salt Lake City star Jen Shah to six and a half years in prison for wire fraud today. She's apologizing in court. She's saying today she hurt innocent people. Back in July, Shaw pleaded guilty to charges relating to her role in a telemarketing scheme that basically ripped off thousands of mostly elderly people. She's going to have to surrender to federal prison next month. Number three, a biotech company says the U.S. government has approved a first-of-its-kind vaccine for honeybees. Not from them, but for them to protect these bees against a disease that reportedly weakens and destroys hives. As you know, the pollinator issue has been a problem uh, for years here in this country. It's not like a shot. They're not going to give bees a shot like you or I would get a vaccine. The company behind it says it works by injecting inactive bacteria into a queen bee's food so that her offspring ends up having immunity. Number four, Delta says it'll offer free Wi-Fi on most of its domestic flights starting next month. So enjoy the eight bucks you don't have to pay. Eventually, it'll get rolled to more flights every week, eventually international. But hey, not so shabby. Number five, that big Mega Millions drawing with a nearly billion dollar jackpot is tonight the sixth biggest jackpot in U.S. history. If nobody wins, the next drawing will be Tuesday. Get your tips. Still to come. Tributes coming in now, today, for a famous surfer killed by a massive, famous wave. What we know about the beach he was at and why the water there gets so dangerous. That's next. One of the world's most active volcanoes, Hawaii's Kilauea, it's erupting again, almost a month after its last eruption stopped. You have to look at this video. It is incredible. It's powerful. It is nature rocking the universe, right? Like, it's interesting, especially when it's not a threat to life. 
Right, that's when it gets scary. So far, it's not. The crater, it's a crater on a summit. That's where, like, the lava flow is confined to, the top of the mountain. You can see lava from different overlooks, from different areas. It's covered something like 300 acres. Marissa Parra joins us now. So, Marissa, besides being fascinating to watch this powerful eruption here, officials say they're not actually worried so yet, not worried so much yet about, like, people, which is a good thing. Yeah, and, and there's a lead scientist who we actually had a chance to speak with about what goes into the decision making there. But you said it yourself, this really is one of the world's most active volcanoes. Hawaii is no stranger to volcanoes. In fact, Kilauea itself, which is the volcano we're talking about right now, erupted last year between September and December. And take a look at these latest images from this latest eruption at its start. This was spewing lava upwards of 160 feet into the air. And for some perspective, Hallie, that's about the size of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I mean, that lava was so fast moving at its start. And we know just how devastating these eruptions can be. In 2018, the damage caused damage rather to 650 homes, and it caused millions of dollars worth of damage to farmers' crops. It evacuated neighborhood after neighborhood. Thankfully, that did not turn out to be deadly, but we do know that there were people injured from that one. So, as you mentioned, this was downgraded from code red to code orange. And as I just mentioned, we had a chance to speak with some one from the Hawaiian Volcano Institute, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. This is Ken Han. He was telling us that they look at all the activity, the seismic activity, to keep track of where that lava and magma is headed specifically to assess the risk to the neighbors and everyone that lives around there. Take a listen to what he has to say about a job that has gotten particularly busy over the last few years and months. Kilauea kind of erupts on a yearly basis, so we're always watching it. and. Uh... You know, we had our eyes trained on it pretty heavily. So we saw this about uh, an hour and a half before the eruption began and issued an alert that there was a, an eruption that was probably imminent. So as we mentioned, Hawaii is no stranger to volcanoes. They are stunning to witness, especially when there is no one in harm's way. And we know that it's a big part of the culture, of the history. In fact, local legend has it that the land formed in Hawaii was formed as a result of the goddess of volcanoes. Um, and Hallie, one thing that I thought was interesting, we know that the islands were formed as a result of volcanoes, but we just talked about how this has actually been a result of uh, Hawaii's volcanoes were formed um, and formed lands, and we know that there were hundreds of acres added to Big Island because of a recent eruption. And as our volcanologist pointed out, when this is a safe thing to witness, you're literally watching the world being formed, Tally. Marissa Parra, that's a nice way to think about it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's talk about the tributes coming in tonight for the famous Brazilian surfer Mercio Freire today. He died while surfing off the coast of Portugal. And take a look at this video. It's a spot that's known for having some of the world's biggest surfable waves. I mean, massive, 10 story building height, right? Think about that. Why do the waves get so big? There's a submarine canyon right off the coast, three miles deep, 125 miles long, that stops right before the shoreline. Freire's a veteran surfer, took a fall while practicing a technique known as toe-in surfing. He's 47 and had starred in Mad Dogs, if the name sounds familiar. That was a documentary a few years ago about his push to try to conquer the giant wave Jaws in Hawaii. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us now, and this has really rocked the surfing community, Gabe. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie. And you just saw those pictures from social media um, uh, of this legendary surfer. And I spoke with several of his colleagues today, and they, you know, said that you know they're going to miss his passion for the sport, of course, but they're also going to miss that incredible smile. That he had that a huge infectious smile everywhere he went, and he is a big loss. You know, Marcio Freire was legendary in this sport, and especially over the last few years. And as you mentioned, Hallie, he. You know, uh, got a lot of notoriety after being featured in that documentary uh, back in 2016, where he surfed in, in Hawaii. And you mentioned this particular area, uh, Nazare, uh, where they were. Um, and you know, just a few years ago, there's another surfer that had uh, broke a world record with an 86-foot wave. I spoke to him uh, this afternoon, and he also talked about you know how dangerous this particular area That's could right. be. And you know, he he said that. That there, you know, needed to be more safety regulations in this sport. 
What does that look like? How do you do that for a sport that is so reliant on Mother Nature, right? There's so many uncontrollable aspects to it. Yeah, and, you know, this uh, surfer that I spoke with, um, you know, he said that in his view for this particular area off the coast of Portugal, you know, anybody can basically go out there and, you know, and surf. And he said that there needed to be more safety regulations. Now, he wouldn't speak with regards to what happened with his exact incident, uh, but you mentioned toe-in surfing. And Freire, he was actually known for taking risks when it came to surfing. Back when he was surfing in Hawaii, uh, he actually paddled out when other people were being taken on jet skis. Now, from what we understand and what's been reported, in this case, he was taken out by a jet ski. So there's still certain questions about this particular wave and, you know, why he didn't make it out this time. But the surfing community worldwide is shocked tonight. All Allie. right. Got it. And toe-in surfing, just to understand, that's when the jet ski takes you out. That's Correct. what that is. Yeah, for these okay. big waves, that's that's what they that's uh, do. It's hard there. to get out there. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much, friend. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Coming up, we're taking you over to the CES show, the Consumer Electronics Show, where Big Tech is teaming up with Big Ag. We'll tell you how they hope to fix farming. Plus, one of New York City's biggest hospital system is doing something pretty significant ahead of a possible nurses' strike. We'll tell you about it in the local next. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, at least 10 people have been hurt in a shooting outside a popular South Florida restaurant during what witnesses say was a music video shoot for French Montana, the rapper. Video shows him sitting in a car outside before shots were fired. We don't know how the people who were hurt are doing. We're obviously going to keep you updated as we get more. From our Northeast Bureau, thousands of nurses could go and strike in New York City on Monday. They want more money. They want better staffing. So to get ready for that possible strike, one of the city's biggest hospital systems is relocating sick babies to other places, to other hospitals. They're diverting ambulances from its facilities, according to a memo to staff. It's also starting to reschedule some elective surgeries and appointments just in case. And out of our Midwest Bureau, new photos of a nearly century-old shipwreck in Michigan giving us a look at the Prohibition era. That's because this 200-foot barge was at one point used by the gangster Al Capone. It was a floating speakeasy to get around some of the rules. How about that? Tonight, we're getting an exclusive look at the country's biggest tech show and how big tech is getting together with big ag to try to help feed America in new ways. Our Jake Ward sat down exclusively with the CEO of John Deere at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Because as more and more farmers get older, it's not clear how many younger farmers will replace them. So the company's new technology is designed to, they hope, ease some of that strain in the agriculture system by creating something that looks a little different for the future of farming. Watch. You're taking a very skilled operator out of that cab who's farmed for the last 30 and 40 years, and you're going to have to put somebody in that doesn't have the same skill set. Automation is the solution to that. Jake Ward is joining me now. And, Jake, it's so interesting to hear that because, to, you know, automation is the solution to everything, and then there are some who think automation is the solution to nothing, right? Like, it's, it's kind of an existential crisis that it speaks to in this country. It is really interesting, Hallie, because this is, you know, an environment in which, on the one hand, there's a kind of utopian quality to it. I mean, as you wander this hall, you know, there's all sorts of automation. There's your self-driving vacuum cleaner. There's 3D printing that can create anything. There are all sorts of cooking assistants and the rest of it. On the other hand, in every single one of these use cases, you know there is a big, bad industry. Bad is the wrong word. Sorry. A big industry being disrupted in some fundamental way. And so, you know, we spoke to the, the CEO of John Deere there to talk about, you know, well, what are farmers going to do when the tractor drives itself? Are we going to be losing farmers as a result? His point was, no, you know, that is not going to be the case. In fact, we are running out of farmers in this country. The average age of them is 57 right now. And so we're going to need these folks. We asked him specifically, what would happen, you know, if you only had a family of four left running a farm? And he said, you know what, we're going to run enough new products that we could, in fact, roboticize all of them. Have a listen. I want to deliver that solution uh, to that family so they can be more productive, more profitable, and do the jobs they do in a more environmentally sustainable way. 
So, you know, we're seeing just over and over again all of these parts of CES in that kind of way, roboticizing, automating things. There's really nothing that can't be automated is kind of the takeaway for me from this enormous show, Hal. Real quick, Jake, the China factor at the show is interesting because organizers are like, hey, the U.S. has to stop relying on China so much for manufacturing. Well, that's absolutely right. And what's so interesting is that Chinese participation at this show has plummeted by two-thirds. And the organizers are outwardly saying to American companies, stop relying on China. They are not a reliable geopolitical partner. And you're seeing at this show, Korean companies, Vietnamese companies, just over there is a whole India section. All of that coming into play. The geopolitics of this moment really playing out here on the floor in Vegas, Howard. So fascinating. Jake Ward, thank you so much. We'll look for more from you. Can't wait to see it tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. 6.30 East wherever you get your NBC News. When we come back, Prince Harry's new book, getting backlash not just from some British pundits and monarchy supporters, but now the Taliban. We'll explain after the break. So guess who's calling out Prince Harry today? The Taliban. Why? Because Harry, in his new explosive book, describes killing 25 Taliban fighters while he was in the military. He says it was like taking out chess pieces from the board. Now you've got the leader of the Taliban-led Afghan Foreign Affairs Ministry slamming those comments, saying the people he killed were humans, not chess pieces, people who had families. Prince Harry's press team hasn't commented on that response, but it comes as Harry's opening up about how he says he was incredibly naive about how the British press would treat his relationship with Meghan Markle. Keir Simmons is joining us now. And Keir, the more we learn about this book, the more there are just pieces to this that have so many people responding here, including now the Taliban, right? Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, in Harry's military experience, he clearly learned how to throw grenades, didn't he, uh, Harry? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's really stunning that we've got a copy of the book at NBC News. It's in Spanish. We've been going through translating the pages and confirming what is being reported by many news organizations. And there's just so much of it. And it's just so much of it. I think the Taliban complaining is one thing. Uh, members of the British military are complaining uh, because there's, by their account, it's just not the done thing to go out and talk about how many people you killed in a war zone when you're serving for the British Army. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot of backlash, let's put it that way. Um, and at the same time, it's clear that I think Prince Harry believes that he is telling his story. I don't think you're hearing, it's interesting, isn't it? You're not hearing much of that that we've heard before where people are questioning whether it's true or not. I think it's all pretty genuine in terms of, uh, you know, his account, right. his story. Uh, but uh, there are those questioning whether it's right to just kind of hang all your dirty linen out, to, out like this. Well, to bear all, because, boy, is he bearing all, Kier. I mean, he's getting vulnerable, yeah. talking about, like, we talked about using drugs, talked about losing his virginity, talked about seeing his grandmother, yeah. the queen, at her deathbed. I mean, these are, like, pretty raw moments. Yeah, that's right. Uh, talking about finding out that his grandmother died, the Queen died, finding out on the BBC website as, as he landed in a jet to try to get to her. Uh, talking about the clashes uh, with his brother, further conversations uh, about that, and then clashes between Kate and, and Meghan, where allegedly uh, Meghan, according to Harry, uh, Meghan uh, said to Kate that she had a baby brain after she'd just given birth and, and then ended up with a confrontation between Meghan and William, uh, William confronting her about that and wagging his finger in her face, according to William's, uh, Harry's account. I mean, it just it pulls back the curtain, doesn't it, on how bad things have been. I mean, I guess we shouldn't be surprised because, after all, uh, Harry and Meghan left. Uh, so I guess yeah. we shouldn't be shocked in that sense that things really have been so terrible. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, do you remember that a while back there was all these conversations about whether the crown was true or not? And there are still questions about whether some of the details, yeah. and obviously it's not a historical record, the crown. Uh, but that's all gone away, hasn't it? Because, frankly, it's worse. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Keir Simmons, that is quite the statement. And I mean, that's the reality of where we are at the moment here with this book set to come out next week. Obviously, yeah. Prince Harry going to be out doing a bunch of media over the weekend. It'll air. Uh, I'm sure you'll be watching it. We will, too. Keir Simmons, thank you. Good to see you. That does it for us on this Friday. Remember, tonight I'll be hosting a special report on the January 6th committee, its report, its investigation, the key moments. That's right here at 9 o'clock. However, you're streaming this now on NBC News Now. We'll see you tonight. We'll see you this weekend. I'll see you back here Monday. More coverage picks up right now.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.